Victory, Sam. Victory. We've won. What do we win? <laughs> sweet, sweet victory, Sam. Yeah, is did they finish the OGL? Uh, the OGL is finished. It's done. We've won. The community has rallied together like a great army against the final raid boss of Dungeons and Dragons, Wizards of the Coast. The great big bad. Yeah, the, the big bad has been vanquished, although they might return at a later date because, you know, that's how CEOs work. They brought in the big guy from Microsoft to try to monetize the whole thing like a video game. But guess what? We're older than video games. This is an ancient kind of magic that D and D. They should have brought the people from EA. <laughs> <laughs> oh hell no! I couldn't live with that. Anyway, let's start the show. Okay, so in the studio today with us, we have a special guest. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, sure. Hi, I, uh, I'm Tim van Dalen. You can say Dalen if it's easier to pronounce. Um, I make RPG content. Um, I, I think I used to say I, I made D&D content, but after this last uh, very interesting month, um, I've had to reevaluate those choices. So I'm not sure where I stand yet. Uh, very happy with the yesterday's news, uh, um, but getting right back into it, um, making uh, mostly adventures, supporting books for uh, up on up until this point, 5e, uh, but looking to branch out after all of this interesting weirdness we've been uh, thrown in. So thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, of course. Oh, thanks for uh, coming on. Uh, honestly, I was uh, very surprised with the news yesterday. I thought it would take like a couple more weeks, but I guess they saw the writing on the wall and it's about I mean, time. Honestly, honestly. I, I didn't think it was going to happen like this anymore. I had, um, I think over the past week and a half, I, I, I was traveling. I'd taken some, some time away from this and decided to not follow everything in the play by play, which was very good for my mental health over the past uh, week and a half. Um, so, so coming back from, from my travels and hearing this news yesterday was really unbelievable. Uh, I did not see this coming at all. I thought we they were maybe going to back down on some things. Really, the thing I was hoping for at this point was to get a grace period of like six months so we could all get our projects out and then be done with it. So I didn't see this coming. I'm, I'm super relieved. Well, you know, what? I think you took the right approach because, you know what they say, a watched pot never boils. <laughs> so stepping away from the situation, just kind of letting things uh, go and run its course, coming back and, you know, with the lowest of expectations, you got the biggest surprise of all. And that's a yeah. wonderful experience, in my opinion. And, you know, indeed, I do want to I do want to shout out uh, the, the community leaders and folks who stepped up to to get all of the outrage directed in a, in, in, in kind of a productive way because I do firmly believe that without all of the organized outrage we saw and right uh, rightly so mm. um, this would not have happened so I, I do want to recognize that oh absolutely uh, like uh, what was it the RPG guy the D D shorts the beard dude mm. He was like spearheading this shit. Like he was supposed to be just your typical run of the mill D and D meme lord, but here he was up at the front line taking on Wizards of the Coast. Like I didn't expect that from him, but like he just came out in full force. And I guess it's always the little guy that you never expect—a real David Goliath situation. In, indeed, in the early days, I think one of the the first people that stepped up was a a lawyer. I I I know uh, from from the creator circles. I'm not going to call call him out too much anymore because he doesn't want all of the attention. But he he wrote one of the first letters to Wizards of the Coast demanding an answer, and a lot of people rallied around that and a, a community server that was created. So I think that really helped get creators uh, working towards the same thing. So I think on the one side you saw the impact of YouTube on this whole thing, where uh, maybe the the players, the consumers, were also starting to get riled up. Uh, uh, and 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 on the other side, you have creators really panicking in a very productive way, and 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 working together yeah. towards 
getting some stuff changed. So I think really, really good all around. So uh, for, sure. for for anyone that's not super familiar with what's going on, do you guys want to uh, maybe explain what happened with the new OGL? Yeah, sure. Um, so so to, to give the real big picture overview, the, the OGL, the Open Gaming License, uh, is a, a legal document that has ex- existed now for like 20 years uh, that essentially allows you to use content that is designated as open within your product, as long as your product uh, also is under this open gaming license. And one of the things that was open under this was the 5E uh, Dungeons and Dragons systems reference document, which is basically a big PDF with some of the core rules of d and uh, that creators can use to build upon. Um, now the OGL is basically something that says, this is what we wizards uh, explicitly allow you to use um, and we won't sue you if you do this. Uh, that's kind of the promise. Now, important to note is that probably there's a lot of things you can do without agreeing to these terms and still being safe, uh, but it's kind of this promise of, of Wizards of the Coast not coming after you that was very important to creators. Like even even if you're legally in the right, um, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you have the funds to defend yourself, basically. So right. that's that's the OGL. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I myself have created uh, currently two books uh, that are uh, under the OGL, uh, so that allow me to build upon monsters from D and D. Not all of them. Not the the, the really um, like not like beholders or something that's really D and D, but core monsters you can reuse. You can reuse kind of core rules. Um, Now, what happened uh, is that uh, Wizards of the Coast decided um, that they kind of didn't like this situation of openness and they wanted to get some more control in their walled garden. Uh, And they decided that they could revoke or deauthorize this previous version of the OGL. Uh, I am not convinced that they could, legally speaking. uh, And and I've heard a lot of arguments on why this is uh, definitely not a clear-cut case that they could. Um, but they think they can, uh, and that's kind of the, the important thing, right? So they mm-hmm. decided, okay, we're going to not uh, support this anymore. We're going to have a new version that in their original leaked version has stuff like royalties, um, absurd amount of royalties, um, having to report uh, any product that you make or uh, kind of all sorts of uh, limits on using this open content uh, that really, really make it impossible for independent creators like myself to operate. Um, And the community was outraged, rightly so, fought back. And yesterday, uh, Wizards of the Coast uh, announced that they were dropping their plans to change the OGL. And they even uh, made the fifth edition systems reference document available as a Creative Commons uh, uh, type license thing. So it's even more open than it was before. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the... High level rundown, I'd say. Did I get anything wrong? Fantastic. No, I think you nailed it. <laughs> yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things where I think the people that they brought in to try to quote fix D and D were the kind of people that thought, okay, D and D is the kind of thing that we could turn into like a Disney operation. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, we can't all be Disney, and even Disney can't be Disney for long because they're losing the uh, rights to Mickey Mouse. It before too long i believe it's like in the next year or so uh correct me if i'm wrong but if anyone oh, i'm not sure uh, knows <laughs> i haven't heard of it i mean it makes sense that it would happen uh, yeah i mean eventually uh, they're one of the biggest companies known for extending copyright law right. but mm-hmm. when it comes to a pen and paper thing D is in essence highly homebrewed mm-hmm. uh, my father for example like him and his buddies would be playing D as they were walking home from school <laughs> Like stopping, like maybe oh. every couple blocks to roll a single D twenty that they were sharing. Oh, shit. Like, you ain't, you can't That's stop cool. that. Like it says right at the start of the book <laughs> that the DM has full power mm-hmm. to take stuff out, put things in, make shit up, and honestly, that's what makes the community so great. It's one of those things that made Skyrim, for example, so great. It wasn't that Skyrim is a great game, although it it is. 
it's that the modding community kept it alive mm -hmm. and D and D and all tabletops really it's the community that keeps it alive with what we do with it. Right. Definitely. And you can really see that. I, I think I, I'm a relatively new publisher, uh, but you can really see that all of the third party publishers that have been active for D and D over the past decade, decades, uh, even, uh, especially for fifth edition have really created the support material that Wizards of the Coast have not been creating. And I think if you look at something like the DMs Guild, there's lots of like must have buys. And you can see that uh, mm. all of this com community support really makes the game much better uh, than if Wizards of the Coast was just doing this alone. And I think that's what they lost sight of. So yeah. to give you a little example, if you look at one of the, so this is the Ems Guild, so that's a completely different licensing situation, but it's still independent creators. If you look at the the hardcover adventures that have been released uh, in, in in the last two three years, there's uh, a ton of like guides on the Ems Guild for how to effectively run these, and a lot of those supplements fix like core issues uh, in those adventures and introduce really important things that I think like they should have been in the main book. And if it wasn't for the DMs guild and these, these guides, I think a lot of people would have a, a much worse experience running these adventures than they have now. And I think that's what they lost sight of. Absolutely. It's one of those things where the closer you get to something, the harder it is to see. Like I walk into my fridge every day and I open it up and I know generally where things are. Every once in a while, I can't fucking find that mustard on the fridge <laughs> right there in front of my face. But I can't see it. I physically, mentally, I cannot see the mustard on the door, even though it's right in front of me. And I feel like this is no different mm. whatsoever. Yeah, I feel like, um, you know, when people don't like change and that change scared the community. And I feel like that fear kind of showed how much people love D&D. &D. Yeah, well, I think the community came together. But unfortunately, the scars from this are going to run deep mm. as if For enough sure. people in the community didn't have anxiety and trust issues. <laughs> I mean, oh, damn, it, it's going to no. be a rough patch for a while. For sure. I think the biggest the biggest effect I saw from this, like the day after the leaks dropped, was just that huge loss of enthusiasm mm -hmm. and hype in a community where people that were your biggest fans are now detractors and like there was all of this free flowing energy of people that were making content uh, that were just really excited about the game, uh, sharing it with people. They suddenly just dropped and all of that enthusiasm and hype just, just evaporated basically. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of the, the biggest loss here. You know, Pathfinder scale skyrocketed. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I feel so dumb right now. I didn't have the money to invest in some Pathfinder stock. <laughs> I, I, it's just crazy. Like I am missing an opportunity. If I had just sunk a ton of money into some Hasbro yesterday, that would have been awesome. But I ain't got that kind of funds. It, I'm not going to give stock tips up here because uh, I ain't a, a fiduciary or a financial advisor. But I will say it'd be it might be beneficial to take this whole debacle into consideration if you want to make a quick buck. <laughs> stock advice from Orion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, not stock advice. I am not a fiduciary advisor <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> All right, Sam. Uh, so what do we got for our monster of the week? So I am presenting skeletons in all their bony glory. <laughs> bony glory. That's beautiful. Bleach white, clickety clackety. All right, so the mechs that pilot our meat suits are a popular form of physically manifested undead found <laughs> throughout fiction, notably in works of fiction, science fiction, and horror, such as the Draugr from Norse mythology and things like Skyrim. Now, I'm not too sure if there's like a big difference between Draugr and like regular skeletons. Uh, I thought but Draugr were like a uh, fallen warrior skeleton type deal. Right. Uh, most skeletons can retain like their abilities that they had in life. So it makes sense that a kind of magical warrior or mage of some kind could retain those abilities. Right, right. 
Um, and unlike many adaptations of the stock zombie archetype, skeletons usually lack any flesh, are usually made up of only animated bone, and are trace muscles and ligaments. Uh, more than often, skeletons are portrayed with motor skills as good as they were in life, despite the lack of visible flesh compared to the former. Animated skeletons, along with the Grim Reaper, have been used as pers personifications of death since the Middle Ages. That sounds about right. Right, right. So, you know, the Grim Reaper is through all kinds of cultures. Dude, would you believe, like, I was listening to a podcast like a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a this girl on the podcast who had a skeleton fetish. <laughs> yeah, th that's a okay. thing. Uh -oh. <laughs> Right. Yeah, like there, there's a whole subset of like a skeleton hentai community that like what? it's yeah. Most of the people that are super into it are women. I, I don't know. I guess there's something that happens with childhood in cartoons where wires get crossed in your brains, and there's like so much skeleton media, kind of like how uh, furries are made. <laughs> I, I would imagine Space Jam is responsible for many a furry. So it would be. Uh... Would like Nightmare Before Christmas be the uh, catalyst, like Zootopia? For Holy <laughs> shit, I think you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> the Nightmare Before Christmas created the skeleton fetish. Oh Damn it, Jack. God. Look what he did. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying we need more skeletons in the game because of bards? There are a lot of different kinds, you know? They could really be anything. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm very down for that. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if I put a Rask skeleton is that gonna shake things up a bit <laughs> i don't think because i don't really <laughs> think you can kill Tarask. but uh, for things like uh you can certainly animals, try <laughs> yeah some animals are usually uh, mo often used mostly humans obviously but horses bulls rams rats uh, are similarly used in these kind of fashions as pets or seeds I think this horse skeleton might be the most practical use for a necromancer. Right. right. It's Unlimited horsepower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think skeleton animals are a lot more threatening. Than <laughs> They're just so creepy. Humans. Like, if you got attacked by a swarm of skeletal squirrels, Ooh. that's terrifying. That would be terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but is it more terrifying than regular squirrels, though? Yes. I mean, regular I, I would squirrels say, are yeah. already kind of terrifying. They, they it, are. It's like a horde. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a squirrel skeleton, but I would imagine that it's not nearly as fluffy, so you're looking at this thing. <laughs> it's all, like, crouchy, and you don't know what the fuck you're looking at at first. It's bones I imagine, cracking. <laughs> I imagine they're twitchy. Yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah, it's the twitchiness and speed that would let you Maybe know. Maybe playing with a, with like a switchblade or something? <laughs> That's what I'm picturing right now. Or with a butterfly knife. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Doing tricks? I'm sold. If I just have <laughs> necromancers with a pocket squirrel. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Yeah, pocket squirrel. It's like uh, in China. <laughs> the uh, I, If I remember correctly, the royalty, uh, they would have these things called sleeve dogs. Okay. Right? And it's literally like they have these super baggy sleeves. They've joined their arms together and they just keep these dogs in there. So if someone tries to attack and assassinate them, they just point their sleeves out and then these dogs just attack. It'd be like that, but with squirrels. <laughs> Where did you hear about this? <laughs> I, 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 I know a lot of things. Do you have a fact checker on this? Or? <laughs> uh, no, this is a legitimate thing. Uh, what can I say? I got worldly knowledges. We have any uh, <laughs> Chinese guests? Please let us know if this is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, canceled. Uh, this show is offensive to China. <laughs> oh no, can't go over there offending China. I I know, but at the same time, we don't play basketball. Both of us are too <laughs> short for that. That's very true. That's very true. <laughs> so, hmm. what exactly is a skeleton in D and D? <laughs> we know what it is in media. We got. Spooky, scary skeletons, jack skeleton, all that stuff. Skeletons scary are... Scary skeleton. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Skeletons, I know, I'm so tempted to. <laughs> skeletons are the remains of humans and animals animated or resurrected by necromancy. Giving them a sense of vitality. This magic assembles their bones and whatever else remains. And gives it the energy needed to execute mainly simple and familiar movements. Hmm. A skeleton has no memories of their past. However... 
The resurrection of a skeleton restores the soul and some base primal emotions that come with it. The skeleton that is reanimated is completely obedient to their master. They follow the orders given to them without hesitation and without any free will. Huh. You know what? I think I have a theory as to why they retain memory. They do not. No, no. They, they retain like little bits of memory. Like they, they can, they might return to things that they did in life. Like say you have a minor and they just, they just start making a See that? motion. I, I do talk about that. That is called habitual. Um, what was it called? Habitual. Where is it? Habitual behaviors. Yeah, I read about that earlier when I was kind of brushing up on the subject, and I decided, okay, I, I need to figure out why they're doing this, and here's my theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know how when someone gets an organ transplant, sometimes after the organ transplant, they have a few more proclivities, like uh -huh. maybe they like grapefruit this time or after that, and the person that had the organ before liked mm -hmm. grapefruit, or maybe they feel a need to go for a jog a little bit more more often and the person who had the organ before really liked jogging yeah that makes sense yeah i'm thinking that maybe certain memories are stored at a cellular level yeah that and makes sense that could be very much the case with these bones they don't have specific memory but they have like a general memory for the nature of what they would do right what they did in life, very, very slight, and like basic emotions, like, you know, anger, attack, kind of, I don't think yeah. we feel fear, maybe, <laughs> but I would imagine things like that, fear, anger, hunger, whatever, basic like, for primal doorknobs. emotions, <laughs> doorknobs. Yeah, I, I saw that too, they, they can, unlike zombies, they can use doorknobs. Yes, yes, they can, they're not stupid, but they just kind of lack intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what I what I love about skeletons from like a game design uh, perspective. They they are like everyone everyone can kill a skeleton. There's no there's no bad feelings there, right? Because mm -hmm. they are they're sort of half intelligent, but they're not intelligent enough to to really care about them, right? Right. So I think a, a lot of a lot of players uh, nowadays, and and rightfully so, um, are aware of of killing like sentient beings and 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 finding the reasoning behind them and trying to figure out why uh, somebody is acting in a specific way that might seem evil to them, but mm -hmm. might seem might be completely natural uh, to that creature. While a skeleton is just an evil thing that's going to murder you. Right. So if you, if you need to stock a dungeon with something bad, a skeleton is a perfect choice because it's, it's just something that everyone can feel comfortable <laughs> getting rid of yeah. without, yeah thinking too hard about it. And that, 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 that might be a little bit of a cop out from, from like a game design perspective, because you don't have to work out all of those uh, things behind it, but there's always the big bad necromancer behind, behind the skeletons. And you can, you can worry about their motivations and you can worry about their evil plan. And, and maybe their plan isn't so evil, um, but the adventurers can get rid of the skeletons anyway. So I think that's that's really what I what I really like about skeletons from a game design perspective. They're they're easy to just slot in mm -hmm. and and uh, not complicate a, a situation or a plot, uh, and they're a, a great way to uh, get adventurers in, in some fight that is not morally ambiguous. True. Yeah, it gives you more time to be a little bit more whimsical, really, when you think about it, because you're taking moral dilemma, throwing that out the window. <laughs> like you said, everybody can get behind smacking a skeleton around. And the thing here... Yeah, and it, is, yeah you can go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, you need a moral dilemma in some parts of the adventure, right? But if everything is that moral dilemma, uh, it can also uh, slow you down a little bit. And it's really it's really nice to be able to uh, indeed have, have a few more simple encounters where everyone can get behind uh, smacking the bones. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah, and like I, I was saying with getting creative with these, it's a skeleton. I've seen plenty of uh, pictures of skeletons in games that have four arms. And yeah. We mentioned earlier animal skeletons. Uh, any race, anything you want, fit them mm -hmm. together. It, it's like there's the sky's the limit. You can get creative on the fly as a DM. Right. Oh, this uh, skeleton has a third arm for some reason. So if you feel like your players uh, need a little something to 
mess around with so your skeleton in combat isn't too boring you just on the spot throw in whatever like oh no th- this Definitely. one is part crocodile <laughs> yeah they have and so it's, much it's control. always easy to explain the hybrids right uh, the, the bones got mixed up by the necromancer they were on one big pile i don't know it just happened that way yeah, yeah maybe he's like a he was experimenting a bit <laughs> drunk necromancer <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't know the ethical standards that most drunk necromancers adhere to, but I imagine they're not that high. So. I, yeah, I would imagine <laughs> very low, <laughs> very very low. It's like I would say that's a Rick Sanchez situation where it's like, ah, well, he's not exactly worried about ethics. He's just slapping shit together and he's drunk. So he's like, let's see if this see works. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the topic of their uh, their intelligence. <clears throat> While lacking intelligence, they are still able to figure things out for themselves. They won't fall down a flight of stairs just because they weren't told to take the stairs. When without control for or orders, um, they retain their habitual behaviors, meaning the things that they did in their past lives, such as open doors or walk down stairs, are done instinctively. However, a difference is that skeletons will attack any living entity on site. This is due to the necromantic power that dwells within them, uh, that gives them a sort of urge to kill without morals and fear, unless specifically told not to. Due to their necromantic magic, uh, making them want to kill mortals, this makes them excellent dungeon traps, like you said. They will lay dormant until a living being enters their detection range. They'll just wait (laughs) forever. (laughs) Why wouldn't they? They're just so mechanical in nature. I once read a thing on Reddit where this guy uh, is a necromancer. I guess he was a college student. Mm-hmm. He created a Turing machine with a hollowed out mountain and skeletons just to perform basic computational functions. Yeah. I thought that was wild. <laughs> you know, people always ask, like, skeletons don't have eyes. How do they see? And I feel like my my theory, the way that I like to think about it, the the magic that animates them, right, gives them kind of like a magical sense where they just yeah. kind of can sense the life force. They're not exactly seeing you, but it at least to me, it makes sense that they would be able to kind of see your magic or see your energy yeah, that makes sense. in some kind of way. Yeah, it'd be kind of like a... Um, uh, I want to say like, like a ghost being able to see, you know? Right, yeah. Being like inherently dead and having that magic kind of infused within them, you know, magical creatures can sense other magic... I don't see why not. (laughs) Right? So, there are a few variants. I was looking through a couple lists, and there were some interesting ones that I kind of picked out of them. So, some of my favorites were the dinosaur skeleton. So, maybe your (laughs) thoracic idea isn't too crazy. I guess not. Yeah, I used used one of those uh, in in, in a book recently. Um, Or actually... It, it was, um, I think it was in, yeah, it was in Volos Veta Vendors, mm-hmm. which is a collection of, of 20 shops I did where I had 10 uh, co-creators that, that all made two shops. So when I say I did it, I'm, I'm taking credit for the work that the designer of that shop did. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I did uh, uh, do the lead design on that book. Uh, but they imagined um, this, this kind of huge sprawling store where you could get everything you liked and and there was there was a garden and in the garden there was this uh t-rex skeleton that was normally just a display piece uh but in one of the drama elements we included uh that skeleton came to life and started i think barfing up zombies oh. um, <laughs> oh, no. i love if it I remember correctly oh, no. <laughs> uh, and just kind of rampaging from there that's crazy See, there, there's just so much potential, and it's really the simple things in D and D that have the highest potential threshold, in my opinion. Definitely, definitely yeah. the little things. Things that are like kind of, kind of left to the DM's kind of uh, devices <laughs> is always really fun because you can really do whatever you want with it. Mm, absolutely. So, a couple more that I have are the storm giant skeleton. The Minotaur skeleton, giant shark skeleton, just horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of uh, the Ithiosaur uh, from Half Life, like 
Dude, I had a friend that played Half Life, and having a monstrous little chompy fuck in the water gave him a fear of video game water for over a decade. <laughs> Should play Ark. <laughs> I'd really hate it. <laughs> no, probably. But water combat with a skeletal giant shark. Dude, mm-hmm. that's wild. You kind of go to a underwater temple. There's just a horde of like, what, what are the sharks called? Hordes? Packs? <laughs> a pack of like Ooh, sharks? <laughs> I feel like if you call them a pack, they're, you have to give them pack tactics. And that's just a whole Ooh. extra. Oh, danger. no. <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's, pack Let's pack not do that. <laughs> <laughs> too much. Too much. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, let me go over the basic abilities they have and their stats. So they have a strength of 10, dexterity of 14, constitution of 15, intelligence of 6, wisdom of 8, and charisma of 5. They have uh, 60 feet of dark vision, (laughs) apparently. And they also knew all, they they know all languages that they knew in life, but they cannot speak. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So if you could find a way to make them able to speak, like say a telepathy that might be viable yeah communicate with your kind of drones i guess like maybe and it, i believe it is pretty common that people know that uh skeletons are kind of vulnerable to bludgeoning as you can't really <laughs> stab a bone <laughs> and they are immune to poison logically <laughs> yeah that makes sense. that makes sense yeah oh, yeah that's about all i have for skeletons today Definitely, I feel a lot better about them. I kind of, kind of wrote them off, you know, kind of looked over them a lot. But Same. I've been sleeping the, on this. Yeah, I've been sleeping on skeletons. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wrote a whole skeleton-based book, so I, I am very, I'm, I'm very aware of them. Top of mind, they're they're great. Mm. I'll have to check that out, maybe. Honestly, I I've looked over some of his work, and <laughs> it's fantastic. I think one thing oh, I want you. to say about skeletons before we uh, go on to asking you a little bit more about some of the homebrew that you've made is that ounce for ounce bone is stronger than steel. So one cubic inch, well, that's the American measurement we're using here Mm -hmm. uh, can withstand the weight of five standard pickup trucks. So that's like five tons. So if you're Th- that's that's a really American measurement right now. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Pick up trucks per square inch. Cubic inch. Pick up truck. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to convert <laughs> from a pickup truck. Uh, we need a European comparison here. <laughs> okay. But like I was saying, it actually this might be the translatable thing. It takes about four thousand newtons of force to break the typical human femur. What? We're breaking legs on curbs like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the uh, shin bone, but femur's strong. So realistically, by these stats, if the barbarian takes a femur from one of the skeletons, you got yourself easily a D8 of damage. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> they just kind of hit you over the head with a femur. <laughs> Getting smacked with a femur? That's bone on bone destruction. That's all I got for that one. I just thought it was cool as fuck. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like also the proficiency that they have with weapons that kind of translates through their lives uh, kind of makes them able to be translated into any kind of situation. You know, you could have archers, soldiers. You could have them wearing heavy armor if you really wanted to. Yeah, some real Skyrim vibes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely, yeah. Do you have a uh, homebrew for us this week? Um, let's see. What do we want to talk about? I think I, I sent over a couple of things that we that we could talk about. Is there anything in particular that we want to dive in? Well, let's see. I was well. Let's go with whatever uh, you feel like uh, you really want to kind of show, uh, like showcase. Yeah, yeah. We'll let you go first. <laughs> cool. Um, I think I think that's got to be my latest thing, right? You're always you're always working on your latest thing. Um, so about a year ago, I got the opportunity to work with a couple of other publishers on like a cross publisher bundle. And I did my first uh, OGL book, 
which was Amulet at Watcher's Pool. That introduced the mini setting of Freebone Vale. And then um, last year, I did my first Kickstarter project, uh, which was very fun to do and, uh, and very successful for my own measures. Um, and I was able to make Murder in the Shielding Peaks, uh, which is an adventure set on high on a glacier. Um, it was written um, by uh, Sven Trukkebrot uh, with um, some some sort of help from me and and kind of I came up with the 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 location and with the kind of the skeleton of the thing uh, and and Sven made that a thousand times better uh, and then actually wrote it and we we kind of did that collaboratively but he uh, he wrote most of the text so I don't want to claim too much of the ownership here. Um, but it, it's kind of set up as a murder mystery, uh, but then like with a with like a, a, a sick demonic twist uh, where adventurers can kind of go explore in this glacier, find hints of the demonic entity that has been claiming souls here for like an eternity. Uh, and it's getting, it, it's, it's, it's this really nice uh, cold vibes, uh, atmospheric adventure of just lost in a blizzard. Uh, running into really weird situations uh, out in the snow, uh, and I'm really super proud of it, and really really proud of of how the book looks and how it came out uh, and how it plays, uh, and, and, and yeah, super proud of it. Sounds I awesome. Think we're gonna have to look into that because that sounds amazing. I, yeah. I like the sound of it. It's like something I would Thanks. run at my yeah, time. <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely do. Let me know how it goes. I'm always hungry to get those game tales. Is that uh, something that's in like its own kind of world, or is it something that you can translate to to any? Yeah, so the the setting of Freebone Vale is kind of this this one valley basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's intended to be dropped into your homebrew world mm. or into an existing setting. Um, and my next project that I'm actually currently working on is to flesh this out as like a mini drop in setting with just a location guide of all of the things. Uh, all of the places you can go, uh, the factions that are active there, um, adventure seeds for all of the locations. Uh, but these two adventures are kind of set around this place. But I think uh, in general, it's it's such a relatively small place that anywhere you have a mountain in your homebrew world, you can just plop this down and use it like that. Mm -hmm. I like that. Well, it's always sunny in the generic realm. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I've been meaning to make a stinger for that, kind of like a, to the tune of a Wayne's World, like generic realm, generic realm, lots of fun, <laughs> excellent. Me, me, me. Because so much is just interchangeable, and I love it. And that reminds me of uh, I listened to this book a while ago, and it was one of those lit RPG stories, and that uh, the game that they played was called Generica Online, <laughs> <laughs> and it, that just reminded me of that. It was a good book. Uh, generica america here we go <laughs> perfect <laughs> it, it all makes sense now on a side note i you know i was kind of uh gambling or betting on what your accent was going to be like because i hadn't actually spoken to you before the, the show <laughs> good point yeah like i was thinking like norwegian <clears throat> yeah um where where are you from I'm I'm from Holland. Wow. Uh, I'm from Amsterdam. Nice. <laughs> That's cool. I just had a friend ask me if I would ever move to Amsterdam. <laughs> hmm, should he? Yeah. Would you recommend Amsterdam? <laughs> Good question. Um, would I recommend Amsterdam? Well, I, I'm not hit from here originally. I'm I'm from a little further oh. south in the country, but that's relative. It, I mean, uh, it's, it's it's a relatively short distance if you compare it to anywhere. In the U.S., obviously, mm -hmm. um, no, I, I, I like it fine here. Um, I like the Netherlands. Uh, I, I I would recommend uh, you you visit here. Um, it's it's different uh, from the U.S., so uh, I would say before moving here, blindly check it out, see if you if you like it too. Um, but no, Amsterdam's a nice city. It's it's definitely feels a, a lot more. Uh, um, what's the word? It's a lot more manageable than than uh, larger world cities and, and metropolises metropolises. Um, so so yeah, it's 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 nice here. That's awesome. Hmm. 
I think I might so check so how is the how is the accent compared to what you were expecting? Um, you know what? I I wasn't quite sure what to expect. I was like kind of hovering between like hmm, that general time zone, like Norway, <laughs> Poland, maybe. I, I don't know. I mean, there's so but, many different kinds of accents from that side of like the world. <laughs> You know what they say, right? A hundred years is a long time in the U.S., and a hundred miles is a, a long distance in Europe. I've I didn't never heard that, that close, but so. it, that sounds well, accurate. Uh, <laughs> it sounds yeah. about right. I guess when like you do a, kind of look at the Europe map, everything is kind of just <laughs> pushed together. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I guess uh, where I'm living right now, I'm living in a section of the U.S. that's just kind of so far up north that people think we're a part of Canada. Now, and there used to be more of a colloquial accent for this region, but it doesn't really matter much anymore because there's so much media that everyone's just kind of created a hodgepodge. of like The, the accent you hear across the board is just generally the same wherever you go. Mm -hmm. But it used to be all like, hey, yeah, Bob, I'm going to go park the car by the door yard. Well, you know, we'll go to buy the bond. You go park the car by the bond. Oh, hey, Bub, you want you want yourself a whoopie pie? Hey, Bub. <laughs> hey, yeah, Bub. Now you don't want to go on down to Banger because uh, that old Paul Bunyan statue comes to life at night. <laughs> There's strange oh, things that happen in Banger. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's basically the stereotypical Maine accent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was up there for you know job corps, it was <laughs> definitely different than what I was used to. Yeah, it's a very rural region. Mm -hmm. You know, I come from several states down. I live in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty different from Maine, just based on weather alone. Like, uh, dude, New Jersey is where Gotham City it takes place. I, I have the lowest expectations. I always thought it was kind of similar to like <laughs> New York or <laughs> like a Philadelphia. <laughs> It's close. It's just like, damn, yeah, I could I could see Batman having to save New Jersey from itself. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has to. All right. Uh, Sam, do you want to take the next homebrew or should I? Sure. So I present it's kind of a short one, but it's called Aragon's Claw. It is a rare weapon. It's a long sword found on D&D Beyond. Uh, right. Created by... Orcs are not friends. Oh, orcs are friends, not fodder. All right, I can get behind that. <laughs> Your name kind of caught me off guard, so I was like, sure. So, you can use a bonus action to speak this magic sword's command word, causing a caustic shimmer to coat the blade. The caustic coating can eat through any non-magical wood, stone, or metal. While the sword is coated, it deals an extra 2d6 acid damage on any target it hits. The coating remains until you use a bonus action to speak the command word again, or until you drop or sheath the sword. Proficiency with a long sword allows you to add your proficiency bonus to the attack roll for any attack you make with that. 26 extra damage, huh? Yeah. That's, that's, that's a lot. Damage. It's it pretty is. good. <laughs> I'm well, always a fan of kind of letting my players feel powerful <laughs> and i don't i don't mind too much kind of if they're overpowered or if their weapons are a little crazy sure sure probably sure. so fun <laughs> what what was the rarity rating on this one it is uh rare it does rarity. require attunement right hmm. <laughs> it, it seems powerful so got to make that like a late game thing yeah yeah mm. and uh with the whole that too early yeah, with the whole theme to it, I'm, I assume you can make it look however you want it. It could be like a dragon's claw, you know, maybe like a, a demon sword or something. Mm. I kind of like the name because growing up, I loved the book Aragon. Mm -hmm. But then those uh, bastards over in Hollywood decided to ruin it. The book uh, was so good. <laughs> the book was amazing. The movie was trash. Bro, I always wonder why they don't just like, you have the whole script right there. <laughs> just, yeah. Just copy paste. It's not that bad. Yeah. If it was word for word, I would not care. But when they made that Aragon movie, they went and just took a chunk out of the book and just ripped it. And then just put city A, city B, everything that happened in between. Don't worry about it. These yeah. two cities are now one and the same. That Those two separate scenes are now the same. <laughs> They're like, everyone loves this book. What if we just 
change all of it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, I did like how they presented elves in that because they're all like, oh, uh, our magic comes from our language and we speak the ancient tongue. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of neat. And names have power. I think we touched on that in a previous episode. Yeah, makes sense. I always like the way they do magic in different kind of forms of media. Right? It, it can be very interesting. So, Sam, uh, is there anything else for that uh, item there? No, it's kind of a short one, but I thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll say that I'm guilty of also bringing in a short one. But, you know, uh, a plot twist. This one uh, comes to you from me. Whoa. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, slow clap. I'm over not here. the only one bringing say, my, is this my a Ryan original. Oh, yes, uh, it was until I looked online today, and I was, and I found out that I wasn't the first person to come up with this, but I was the first person to come up with it for fifth edition. So, hooray! Uh, it, they already have this in Pathfinder, apparently, but it doesn't work the way that mine does. And it's a very simple item. I, I was watching Forged in Fire one day, and they were asked to make this. It's called a stone throw crossbow, or a stone bow, a stone crossbow. Essentially, all it is is your typical crossbow with a little bit of a sling attachment. So it's a super amped up slingshot, which, you know, you might not think would be too interesting. But what really sets this apart is... As an amped up slingshot, you're going to have better range than your typical sling, which not many players use because they're a little underpowered, but versatile. This is the uh, the one you talked about before. Uh, yes, it is. Ah. So it weighs about five pounds, has a range of 60 to 180. I have it on D&D Beyond for anyone that's willing to look. I'll link it after the show. And the, I think the most important aspect of it is the versatile munitions property, where the ammo can be substituted with any kind of hand-sized object weighing about a pound or less. So flask oil, alchemist fire, rocks, caltrips, potions, smoke bombs, containers, like little bags, some flasks. Those kind of things will be destroyed on impact, but mm -hmm. all it requires is proficiency with a light crossbow. So pretty simple. Most people are able to use it. And what really sets this apart is just I wanted people to be able to have the freedom to use all their tricky tactics at range. So say you got the rogue in the party that's like caltrips, alchemist fire, smoke bombs, and all, all those kind of things. Is this something that would work for like uh, like a tavern brawler? Huh. You know, it, they have the improvised weapon. <laughs> uh, yeah, essentially. It, whatever you put in it is basically improvised. Huh. But the damage to be a D6, which is less than a bow, but more than a sling. Makes sense. I like the utility of it. Yeah. Being able to de deploy at range, that's cool. Oh, absolutely. I wonder if, kind of depending on what you've used, would there be any kind of special effects? Well, I think that's up to the DM at that moment, but I would Im imagine that there would be a bit of a reward if you take a flask of oil and you use that and shoot it at a specific <laughs> spot within range. I want to basically let players that have this as a thing in their game be able to be more tactical with the items they have. Like People are always saying... Marshals are underpowered and casters are too OP. What about when your marshal starts getting crafty? I, mm. I always just think that marshals are fantastic, but not enough people are playing them uh, in a versatile way. Like if every marshal had Batman's utility belt, they'd be good to go. <laughs> Batman's utility belt. Yeah. Caltrips, smoke bombs, oil. And, and shooting cow traps at somebody would suck. <laughs> well, at that point, it becomes kind of like a shotgun, maybe. Like, should I add a Ooh, shotgun uh, mechanic to this? Ooh, a scatter burst of cow traps. Oh, geez. Or ball bearings. That'd be <laughs> yeah. Wild. I guess that's why I had a specified thing where, like, if you put your stuff in a little baggie, then mm. shoot it, the 
the bag will be destroyed on impact. Right. Yeah. Right. Caltrops in over there or ball bearings over there. Is this a uh, a magical weapon or is it like a artifice creation type? Deal? It, it's just a generic weapon. I had to list it as a magic item on uh, D and D Beyond because they don't do regular items for some reason. Mm. Well, that's cool. I, I like do it. think like Galtrops are underused. I uh, it's really it's useful to get to get to deploy them at range. I, I once I once had a had a cobalt tunnel where the the kobolds dug in caltrops in, in like loose sand. So Ooh. then whenever a kobold would walk over it, it would they would just be fine because they weigh next to nothing. Mm-hmm. But if another creature would weigh would walk over it, they would sink into the sand and then hit the caltrop. Oh, <laughs> that's mean, brilliant. Is this part of that book you uh, made the uh, kobold tra- uh, kobold traps? Yeah, indeed. That's an excerpt from Feratrim's Tribal Siege, which is uh, kind of a, a larger adventure uh, they can uh, slot into Storm King's Thunder, uh, mm. and the Cobalt Traps are part of that adventure. There, there's like this huge lair um, uh, for Cobalts there, and it, it's like filled with all these traps. And I had a lot of fun while writing that book, uh, going to uh, kind of the, the like historical sources of people using Cobalts in like truly evil ways. Like um, I'm sure you guys have heard of uh, Tucker's Cobalts, mm-hmm. um, old article. Of, of someone that kind of really like challenged people with like, oh, you think you can defeat a kobold? Well, come into their lair and and, and you'll see how you fare. And mm-hmm. it was really fun to kind of get into that mindset and come up with like the meanest things I could. Like uh, really small corridors where you had to squeeze one by one and then there would be like tiny holes in the side of the corridor and, and there would be kobolds on the other side of the hole just like poking you with their spears <laughs> as you try to walk by. <laughs> you can do against that there isn't it kind of goes back to what we were talking about last week when we compared kobolds to kevin McAllister from home (laughs) (laughs) it's just like okay (laughs) that makes sense how many kevin McAllisters could you take in a fight and it's just like they have all the prep time Mm -hmm. they they got their base it it goes from yeah it it goes from zero to 60 really quick yeah you no, know, one thing we uh, forgot to do, Ryan, the IRL fight score for skeletons. Oh, uh, we did. I would have to say that the thing about skeletons is they're so versatile. Mm-hmm. Um, your generic skeleton, I would say I'd give it a two. A two? Okay. Yeah, pretty slow, kind of shambling. Nothing too special about them. Yeah, but like most things, skeletons... How often are you attacked by just one? Right. You're not. So as soon as more skeletons enter the picture, it gets exponentially more deadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a surprise, surprise deployment of them, right? They're they're just around the room and suddenly they're there and they've surrounded you. Yeah. I think in a straight fight, I could take a skeleton just about any day of the week. Mm -hmm. But with underhanded tactics, trapping and... The typical setting you might find in a dungeon, I myself would run the risk of getting caught off guard if it weren't for the fact that they have that clickety-clackety when they're walking around. But they can also be still for like hours, days, months, years. They don't care. I I would say, yes. It's a lot. (laughs) Yeah, I would say it's about the same. You know, they have so much potential, and it's never, you know, just the one, kind of the whole kobold situation. Mm. So I, I feel like I would probably give them about, basic skeleton, maybe about a three. Anything kind of <laughs> tricky or special, I'll give it about an eight. <laughs> well, what do you think? Uh, where would you fare, uh, fare uh, in a uh, real fight with a skeleton? Whew. As in, how many could I take? <laughs> well, so I mean, if you want to kick- and then, like, if you were to stumble upon a group, like, mm. Ooh. I don't. Know. I think. See the 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 vulnerability to bludgeoning damage that helps a little bit. Mm-hmm. If if you can find like a stick, I don't know, a piece of wood, some something that you could use. Right. Maybe they're. Whew, I don't know. I I've thrown skeletons like in D at, at low level characters and and they can be so deadly that i don't want to 
I, I'm I'm not optimistic about my own chances. Like I'm <laughs> I'm 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 definitely a commoner. Like mm. I I'm not gonna fare well. I don't I don't think I could take a skeleton. Yeah, we always like to ask people these questions because uh, have you ever seen that statistic where like one in three men think that they can fight a bear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like there's legit uh, surveys where there's always like a couple people in a small group that feel mm-hmm. like they could take on a bear. And it's just like, no, dude, right. who, who do you think you are? You ain't <laughs> taking on a bear. Yeah, it's like when you asked, you know, if you could translate your uh, your real life kind of stats to a D&D format. You know? Most people are not going to be that spectacular. <laughs> yeah, I feel like a lot of people dramatically overestimate themselves. Like I'm over here trying to put my stats together and I I think I come up with reasonable expectations for what my stats would be. Mm -hmm. And then everyone else that I ask, there's just like, dude, why the fuck did you give yourself a 16 or an 18 in intelligence? (laughs) Are you a genius? (laughs) Well, it's not even just being a genius. Like, I don't think genius is enough. I think if your IQ is over 130, that can get you a score of like a 16 but to get above that you have to be extremely knowledgeable about things mm-hmm. and always in this kind of a fun thought experiment <laughs> it really is i think we should ask more people in our groups about that because i've always wanted to run a game where the situation is everybody at the table for session zero decides collectively what each person's real life stats are and that right there is just like, okay, I just, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just seems like it'd be a lot of fun to play yourself in a D&D session. Like so right. many people are going to play self inserts. Well, this time it's the most transparent self insert possible. Oh man, I feel like for your modern settings this is kind of what you're going to go with. <laughs> Maybe. I think that I'd probably be more inclined towards an artificer type because I'm very crafty. Mm-hmm. I've had people compare me to a multi-class of bard and artificer, and I'm just like, I could me? see I am, <laughs> I am not that charismatic, but apparently people think so. So this introvert is keeping the charade going. <laughs> You're doing great, man. Got us all fooled. <laughs> I guess one more thing we wanted to ask before you go is uh, on the creative stuff like what's your process good question that's a good question um so normally kind of the way i i start doing this is i get an idea rattling around in my brain um for months usually and i just start writing down little ideas as i get them and then it builds from there um and then usually i take a few days sit down try to work the random ideas I had into a format, into an outline. Uh, and then I just start writing somewhere. Um, I'm like, once I, once I know kind of what the general outline of the thing I'm trying to make is I'm, I'm fairly okay at just writing randomly somewhere in there. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I don't really start at the beginning and work my way towards the end. I can kind of see where the inspiration hits me next. But I can have um, at any one time probably have like 10-ish ideas floating around in my brain for what I could uh, pick up. Um, But I also like one of the things that I really like about creating is making something that is well-rounded and and, and looks professional and and, and feels great. So I, I do like to... Um, make not many uh, releases, but like um, make a few a year that are really focused and that really look nice. So I'm not going to work on everything I think of. Um, So I'm just picking up the thing that I like the most uh, that I want to work on at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's kind of like having a dartboard full of ideas that you've come up with, like maybe like have a notebook on you, write those down. And then when it comes time to get creative, you're like, okay, which one speaks to me right now? Yeah, indeed. Or, or just which one um, has the biggest chance of reaching a lot of people. Mm. Um, so I, 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 I do really consider that bit as well. I know a lot of people, they create because they want to 
get rid of that energy and they just want to create and, and they don't really care if anybody uses it. I am a little bit more selfish, <laughs> I, I think. <laughs> uh, I do I do like it if people uh, use my stuff. Um, so I, I generally do um, consider things like, is this actually going to be useful to anyone? Mm -hmm. uh, or is this, like, can I time this with a hardcover release? That's going to mean I reach more people, stuff like that. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I feel that because as a creator, I definitely want to share my stuff with people too. And uh, I think it's very relatable with like how we're doing the podcast right now. Yeah. So I'm wondering, do you have any uh, projects you'd like to shed any insight on or uh, anything you're like particularly proud of or that you're working on at the moment? So right now uh, I'm working on that setting guide I, I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I have a pre-launch page ready uh, over at Kickstarter. Nice. Um, and, and that's going to be my next big thing. It was on hold for a little bit because I didn't know if I was going to be able to make it uh, because it, it does use some uh, OGL uh, things. It's my first time publishing player options. So there's two subclasses in there, a couple of backgrounds. Um, but as of yesterday, I think I'm, I'm moving forward with the project. Uh, so that's really cool. Um, so that's that's what I'm working on right now, what I'm really proud of. Uh, and just the whole region of, of Freeboneville, it's going to be really cool. And then somewhere in February, the, the partnership between the DMs Guild and uh, OBS um, uh, and, and Roll20 should be complete. Uh, and people will be able to get Roll20 versions of Volus Veta Vendors and Elminster's Excellent Establishments, awesome. two of my shops books, um, which will give people 40 drop-in location shops, drama, adventure, uh, and, and shopkeepers uh, to play with. Mm. It's going to be cool as well. I'm excited for that, honestly, because we usually use Roll20 for most of our games. We prefer yeah, the uh, in-person experience, but oftentimes with such large distances, it's just not possible. I definitely also play with Roll20 when I'm physically at the table sometimes. If, if I have like a large dungeon I'm exploring, mm -hmm. definitely helps me keep everything on track. Oh, oh Absolutely. It can be fantastic for maps when you have like a little screen to work with. Definitely. So where can uh, where can someone find your stuff? What's your uh, what's your Kickstarter? Um. So let me just give you guys the link so you can put go it ahead in and show plug notes. yourself. Let's do yeah. that. Um. So I will I will send you guys a link. We can put it in show notes. But people can find me at rpg.timfedalen.nl, which is probably no one's gonna be able to type that from my pronunciation. <laughs> uh, so let's put that in the show notes as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm yeah. sure people will be excited to check out all the things you've talked about. Definitely going to plug awesome. that down below in the description. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me. This was a blast. Yeah, of course. Thank you for coming. All right. I think it's like a late night where he is right now. Definitely. Yeah. Let's uh, let's go ahead and plug our socials. We are on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube under the Nerd Militia. I do believe we have our Reddit and everything set up. Uh, we did just set that up. <laughs> nice, nice. Is that under the uh, Nerd Militia as well? Yep. Nice. Everybody can go check us out there. We'll be posting stuff uh, on the Facebook and the Twitter for when we're uploading. Um, yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Yeah. Honestly, I'm feeling a little inspired after uh, hearing that. We should make Honestly. a book. <laughs> we should. We were just talking about Definitely. it in the Discord. Yeah, we were talking with uh, some people in our Discord group yesterday about making a book. And it seems like uh, that's probably going to happen within the next 18 months or so. That'd be cool. awesome. Hey, maybe we could uh, have, if you want to make something, uh, help us out with that. That'd be cool. A little bit of a collab. Hey, well, that'd be cool. for sure. <laughs> Collaborations are always cool. All right. And I think that's the show. All right. Everyone have a good day. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>